Hello there, everyone. Ooh. How's my voice here? Is it good? Everything good here? Awesome. <laughs> uh, thank you, everyone, for coming today. Um, wonderful morning in Bratislava, Slovakia. I hope everyone's as awake as I am. Um, my name is Angelo DeLeo. Um, coming from the United States, uh, currently a student at George Washington University, um, and I'm very happy and thankful for the presenters uh, for their acceptance of my talk. Thank you, everyone, for coming, by the way. Um, my, topic, uh, my, po my topic is called, But That's So Hard, Various Cultures Takes on Language Difficulty. Now, this title might imply that I'm going to be talking about simply uh, oh, uh, people in Russia might say this, or people in, Mid in different Middle Eastern cultures might say this about language learning, or um, you know, this language is hard to learn, this la that language is hard to learn. In reality, uh, what I'm going to be talking about is why, uh, is why uh, language learning is an important cultural factor. Um, how people think about uh, language learning as a whole has to do a lot with culture, the place you've grown up, um, and the types of um, uh, people that you meet, the types of things that you learn as you grow up. Um, this has to do with a lot of um, academic topics as well as my own personal experiences. Um, I, wa I wa also want to get your opinion, of course, during the presentation to get some of your opinions, um, things that you've heard and seen um, in your life. So there will be opportunities for that as well. So once again, I thank you for coming. Um, so I'd like to start off with a simple introduction to the topic itself. Um, how did I think of this topic? Firstly, uh, my language learning journey in the United States, uh, I don't know if I would call it unique or not, but um, I haven't heard of anyone else with, you know, what the specific things that I've, I've uh, gone through. I started uh, learning languages when I was 15, starting Latin in high school. Um, I learned Latin, and I moved on to Italian after that because I found that I really enjoyed learning languages. But, as I was moving on to languages that are generally considered harder, such as Russian, such as uh, Mandarin Chinese, such as Arabic, um, I started hearing all these things uh, from people around me. My friends, who by the way don't know Russian, Mandarin, or Arabic, will, uh, you know, th hearing things like, oh, I heard that's really hard. Oh, I heard that's, you know, impossible to learn. How are you doing that? I can't believe you're doing that. It didn't dissuade me because I already enjoyed learning languages, but this gave me a bit of an inkling. How would this affect someone who wasn't such, a, uh, such as much a language enthusiast, let's say? Someone who isn't, you know, like us, uh, like myself, or like you, uh, who take, uh, take language learning as a passion or use it for a job? Um, it has to do a lot, uh, I think, with my classmates in my classroom education. Uh, back when I was in high school, for example, um, in the education setting, I, I remember um, Ever since, I took three years of Spanish in high school since that was a requirement and I was in the honors track and then once I got to the finish of my honors track, you know, I asked my classmates, what do, so like, what do you know in Spanish? What would you say, you know, what, what's, say something that you can say in Spanish and my classroom, my, my classmates might say after, after three years of um, honors Spanish, uh, puedo ir al baño, senor? You know, that sort of thing. And so it's, it's surprising to me. Uh, this is a sort of, um, for an American, I suppose this sort of thing is not typical, uh, my, my situation parti in particular, but that goes to show something about how language learning is also a cultural factor, the, the amount to which people uh, you know, value language learning. And then this goes into US culture and the use of English in general. I'll be describing a little bit more in detail uh, the culture of the U.S., also other factors such as geography, such as the use of English and its necessity um, in the world and how that, uh, you know, might discourage people from learning languages or encourage the growth of a language ideology, which I'll be um, a little, uh, explaining in a little bit more detail. Uh, and of course, uh, I thought of uh, promoting language learning in my own community uh, by going at my university. I am the president and founder of an organization called GW Polyglots um, to help the student body uh, learn languages, find which languages they'd be interested in most, and then help them find the resources that they need to continue and gain motivation. By this organization, I've also talked to many language professors at my own university uh, to, um, you know, form relationships, see if there's in different ways that we can partner, and I hear all these things from the professors, you know, oh, my students think this about uh, Russian, or my students think this about Mandarin, um, and then the different ways that they combat that is also a very interesting topic, which we'll be going into. 
Um, so, since this is the introduction to the topic, I want to put in uh, something that's a little bit, um, you know, just a basic concept, language ideology. This is a very popular concept in linguistic anthropology, an academic uh, field. Um, I, I want to make it, you know, a little bit more layman term. Um, so what is it? It might be uh, just, you know, a preconceived notion that you have about language uh, just in general. It's a very broad term. Um, you know, for example, um, from different types of literature that I've read, maybe um, a, uh, an immigrant family in the United States won't teach their children the home language because they think it'll hurt their English. Or they might uh, not teach them their, their uh, home language because they might think that they will already learn it on their own because of their heritage. Uh, both of these things are real life examples that exist in different parts of the world. New York City, uh, Montreal, there's, there's a couple different uh, areas of study for this. Um, and another interesting concept is how, you know, how broad these things are, how common these things are in different cultures. It might be more or less prevalent um, in the U.S. versus a multicultural um, society, some place in, you know, like a lot of places in Europe. Um, and so I want to introduce the, the concept of language learning ideology. Uh, you know, for example, Americans might say, oh, I don't want to learn Russian because uh, it has a different alphabet. Uh, I talked to the Russian professor at my university, he says, if, if that's your reason, we cover the alphabet in the first two days. So you might always well drop out very quickly. <laughs> um, and another thing is sounds that don't exist in your native language, such as in Arabic. Uh, if you're a native English speaker, Arabic, it might have different sounds. Basically, a language learning ideology is it's summed up blank, therefore it is too hard to learn. Uh, if, if someone gives that sort of answer to you, then that is something that is a language learning ideology. And as being the uh, wonderful, uh, astute la uh, language learners that we are, um, I'm going to give some tips and some recommendations as to how we can promote language learning in our own communities. Um, factors that affect these ideologies include previous language exposure, motivation, and interests. So. Uh, moving on here, why do we care? Why do we care about, you know, if someone says this language is hard, why do we care if, you know, someone is demotivated? I'm motivated, you're motivated uh, to learn languages, so why is this important? My first reason is that ideas spread, good or bad. So, Rosetta Stone, uh, something that, you know, it's a, I don't want to say controversial in the polyglot community, I won't give my own opinions on it, but Rosetta Stone is a very popular tool in the United States, whether or not it works, because they have a very, very good marketing campaign. Uh, you know, whenever an American will think of language learning, usually the first thing that pops in their head is, oh, well, I tried Rosetta Stone for a couple weeks, but I, I think that they have a very good marketing campaign, as I said. And so this, uh, this idea can be applied here as well. If it's a good idea, if you can do it well, or if it's something that's very uh, prevalent in the culture, then it's going to spread to different, uh, different people. It relates to the question, how do we encourage others to learn languages? Uh, I think this is a very important topic if we want the polyglot community to spread, if we want it to gain more uh, you know, uh, notoriety or, or uh, knowledge, um, you know, it's on people's radar, let's say, and to help others to learn languages in the same way, to break down these fears and preconceived uh, you know, stereotypes or, or uh, notions about these languages. Um, as I said, this also matters for the polyglot community. As my father said when I was six years old and didn't want to eat my Brussels sprouts, he said, it's all in your head. Mentality and perspective in the language learning process is one of the most important factors before you start learning a language. If you go into, lear into learning a language saying, well, I'm not sure, I don't know if, you know, Arabic seems really, really tough and I, you know, I don't want to travel there and, you know, with that sort of mindset, you might drop off very quickly in terms of motivation. Uh, you have to make sure that when you're learning a language, of course, I'm sure that you all know this, when you're learning a language, you have to be in the right mindset. You have to have the right perspective. You have to have the right motivation. Not a lot of people do. Um, you know, people who aren't language enthusiasts, you know, in my, in my own example from the United States, you know, people might go in hearing, you know, these types of things. Russian is so hard. Chinese is so hard. Arabic is so hard. And so, um, it's very important to keep this in mind. It's about perspective. You know, I, I can't tell you, in the next point here, I can't tell you how many times I've seen on the, on the Facebook group polyglots, I can't tell you how many times I've seen someone post just simple, simple sentence, what's the hardest language to learn? And then a battle ensues on how hard Chinese is, how hard Arabic is, how hard Russian is, and then, you know, how hard Polish is, English, you know, 
And then someone will comment saying, no, that's easy language. No, that's a hard language, back and forth. Very, very common discussion to have. This is another thing which is, to me, a little bit silly, but um, this goes on to the language learning ideology type thing. Um, and of course, there's also the example of monolingual countries versus multilingual countries. Uh, the example of the USA, uh, the USA, the UK, Italy. Um, I know, I don't know the exact figures, but I've seen a, a couple of infographs before all on, you know, the, the fact that there's very low percentage of second language proficiency in these countries, which is uh, actually interesting with Italy because it's a non-English speaking country, um, but mostly uh, majority English speaking countries have this problem. Um, so don't get confused by this graph or by this chart, but I want to give you this quick example. Um, in English, we say, it's all Greek to me. Uh, pretty common thing. Why, how this originated, not really sure. Maybe one of you might know. Uh, but it shows that there is something in terms of language ideology where we think Greek, difficult. We might not think it personally, but it's, but it's ingrained into uh, the language. Likewise, sorry? It's from Shakespeare. Shakespeare. Yeah, <laughs> well, there we go, Shakespeare. But at the same time, uh, I'm not sure if these other languages have uh, you know, a similar type of uh, writer or author that does, that does uh, you know, form these phrases, but this is a, basically a chart of different languages and the languages that they point to as being the hard language. For example, Italian does it to Arabic. Or I think uh, I learned yesterday from a couple of my Polish friends um, that Polish points to Mandarin Chinese. Um, you know, some might point to Japanese. Some point me, uh, while well, others like uh, I think Chinese, uh, the Mandarin and Cantonese point might point to beyond us or nonsense, for example. Um, but you can see that there are a lot of different things here. Non-native speakers of English. Does anyone have any analogous examples in your, in your language? What do you, I don't know if anyone that says anything different, like uh, for an, in Italian you might say, uh, per me arabo, but does anyone have any other examples by chance? Yes. In India, there's a great, I mean, every state has its own language. So I come from the eastern part of India where I speak, my mother tongue is Bengali. So for us, South Indian languages are like, yeah, I don't want to say anything out of it. So it's like South Indian form. That's actually really interesting. I haven't heard that before, but that's, that's really cool. Uh, thank you for that answer. Anyone else? Yes. In Chinese, we say it's a book from the habit. Book from the habit. Okay. That's, that's, a different, that's a different example. I haven't heard that before. Anyone else? Yes. Uh, in Bulgarian, we are saying, uh, do you speak Pata Patagonian to me? <laughs> <laughs> okay, different example as well. And, and yeah, yeah, um, in, yeah, like you can see in the chat, in, the, in Denmark, we would say, hey, that somebody is speaking Bulgarian. But also, if, if there's something specific you don't understand, then you would say that it's a town in Russia. A town where? In Russia. Okay, <laughs> that's hey, very interesting examples. But we see that these things are common in a lot of languages. All, I mean, a lot of these languages here have those types of analogous examples where it might not point to Greek, but it might point to other languages. Thank you for those examples, everyone. Um, so we can see that this is grounded in a couple concrete examples. Um, going to my past research on this, plus the concept of American universities, which is you know language learning in uh, American universities, I'll go into that. Um, I presented at a conference, uh, the ICT for Language Learning Conference. For that, I did a little bit of research, um, which involved in, uh, interviewing some language professors at my university. And I noticed very, uh, very, very distinct uh, uh, methods for dealing with language ideology in, in students. The Russian professor, the head of our Russian department, I interviewed him, and he was, he was already known for being a very uh, hard professor, a very strict professor. Um, he, like I told you before, I said, well, what if a student comes to you asking for help? You know, they're worried about uh, the, the alphabet. They're worried about uh, the grammar and how difficult that it is. Basically, he says um, that, you know, if you're worried about the alphabet, drop it because we, we drop the class because we learned it in the first two days. If you're worried about the grammar, listen, if you can't pick it up, then, you know, you're falling behind the class, then whatever. <laughs> that was basically the attitude he took toward it. 
very, very, a lot stricter looking for people with actual motivation to learn Russian, which is one way of dealing with it. Then I went to the French professor, the head of the French department. He said, you know, we try to help you. We give you extra practice. We provide you with extra resources. You know, you can come and talk, uh, try to practice with me at, at my office hours, things like that. Um, very supportive, a lot more supportive. Then I talked to the head of the Arabic department. He said specifically that he recognizes these things in his students. He knows that what the uh, stereotypes about uh, Arabic are to a lot of English speakers. You know, different alphabet, number one. Uh, the different sounds, number two. You know, all the other things. I heard the grammar is really hard. I, you know, so many dialects. How can I understand anyone? And he says that, that their courses are specifically designed to break down those types of thoughts about the language. And with it come improvement and increased motivation. Um, basically, in the American school system, I'm not sure how it works in a lot of school systems in Europe or Asia, um, but basically there is a, a little bit of a notion in the students that some languages can, in fact, be impossible to learn. You know, uh, for Americans who, uh, you know, aren't very familiar with language learning, they might say those types of languages, you know, uh, especially the, the, the very notorious ones like Finnish and Icelandic. They might say, oh, that's impossible. I wish I could do that. I, that's another phrase that I just, I just remember now. I wish I could do that. That's something that speaks to me as I can't do it. That's what they're implying. That's a type of thing that uh, this presentation speaks to. And uh, this leads to discouragement of students from what they hear from their peers. Everyone around them, growing up in school, their family, uh, their friends, everything, in every situation, whatever language comes up, at least in the United States, they might hear, oh, this is really hard. That, you know, don't do that. That's really hard. You, you know, choose Spanish. It's an easier language. Don't choose, don't choose Russian. Don't choose, just go with, just go with Spanish. Go with Italian. It's easier. So we see these examples. Looking at English. The concept of necessity of English, um, English is seen, that, well, uh, explaining the background and the reasons for why this might exist in these countries, um, the concept of necessity. Um, in, the in the US, in the UK, everyone already speaks English, but for the rest of the world who, doesn't have, uh, who aren't native speakers of English, they need it as the international language if they're not, already, if they're not going to a country whose language they speak. Uh, they need to communicate, they, need it, they might need it for a job, they might need it for their own personal reasons. Um, this creates a difference between native speakers and foreign learners. Uh, as in, native speakers might say, oh, I don't need to learn a language. I, need to, I can go anywhere in the world, and, they, and people will speak my language. I don't need to learn a, a foreign language, period. Foreign learners might say, well, English is very necessary. Uh, I need to go anywhere so people will communicate with me. So it's a little bit similar, but there's specific differences in motivation for not learning a foreign language versus learning a foreign language. And then, if foreign learners who already know English will be more inclined to learn another foreign language because they are already familiar with the process if they are fluent in the second language. Um, and that leads to, you know, maybe possibly language learning ideology in other cultures due to English or other languages. One other thing that I notice is that I remember when I was first learning Russian, um, a lot of Russian speakers told me, oh, you know, Russian's really hard. You know it's really hard. You've heard it's really hard, right? I said, yeah, I, you know, it's pretty complex grammar and things, but I like grammar. But you know it's hard, right? <laughs> so you want to make sure that if you're a native speaker of one of those languages, uh, I'll give a, a couple recommendations at the end of the presentation, but uh, be aware of what the saying that ty those types of things to people has what effect that has on their motivation to learn a language or their decision to pick up the language. And then a little bit more looking at English. This, uh, gra this infograph here um, is the representation of languages in the United States. So we see that it's mostly English and Spanish, but Spanish, the majority of Spanish comes from immigrants. English, uh, mostly native speakers and immigrants who move to the United States and learn a second language. And then we also have a couple others like Chinese, Tagalog, Vietnamese, and French. Um, but looking at this, Americans, those reasons for, the, for language ideology existing in America has to do with history, geography, culture, you know, um, uh, Americans, you know, spreading uh, culture around the world, different types of things. Mostly, Americans view la language and multi, uh, multilingualism from a utilitarian standpoint. They'll say, I'm learning a language because I can get a job with it. I'm learning a language because I want to go to France and I need to order a beer there. Um, you know, practicality 
is mostly the king of language, of, of language learning, the reasons there. Um, whereas, you know, not understanding other cultures isn't really, isn't really the reason for a lot of the people that I've talked to. It's mostly, uh, you know, because people will say, why do you want to learn Hungarian? I said that I'm interested in Hungarian. Why do you want to learn Hungarian? You're never gonna, you're never gonna get a job with that. Why do you, you're not gonna make any money with that. I said, well, you know, I don't look at language from a utilitarian perspective, you know, that type of practical standpoint. You're crazy. Anyway, looking at Europe, same example. Europe, geography and culture, it's almost similar except the inverse. Um, multilingualism from multiple standpoints. A European identity. Multi uh, multiculturalism is more of a value. Um, sure, people might still learn for utilitarian perspectives. You know, I'm going to France because I want to get a job in France. I like France. But they also will understand that it's also important to understand the culture. Um, you know, these are a little bit of generalizations. Of course, there's variation, but I think on the whole, uh, this is, you know, the difference between the United States and Europe. Um, and again, there's that foreign learner perspective. Um, you know, learning English, they might have a different perspective because they already know a foreign language. And other examples, <clears throat> such as China or the Middle East, um, I know that from my own teaching experience, um, a, lot of, a lot of people in China uh, from, my, from my students, they want to learn English. They have a very, they have a drive, they know it's ne uh, necessary, whether it's for a job um, or whatever their motivations are, they really do want to learn it. But then a lot of my Chinese friends, you know, it's at the same time, not many of them speak English on a daily basis or practice with native speakers on a daily basis. There's that thing too. Um, the Middle East, uh, kind of similar, it really depends on the country since it's a vast area. Um, but for example, my, my Saudi friends, same deal. They really need to. They really want to learn it because they know it's necessary, but might not practice every day with a native speaker. Um, <clears throat> looking at stereotypes, myth and reality, uh, my own personal experiences with uh, Russian, the alphabet. Um, this is the same thing that I was saying before. Russia, you, you know, uh, with with Russian, the alphabet might be different, so it might put people off. With China, it's the, it's with Chinese that language. It's it's the characters and the tones most definitely. People will say, "Oh, but it's a to it's tones." Like, how do you go the ah ah ah? Uh, you know, how do you do that sort of thing? That's so that's so confusing to me. And then how they don't use letters? What? That's crazy. Um, and so other Americans' opinions on these types of things, they might have a different perspective than I would um, on these sorts of languages because they have these preconceived notions. They've never tried it out, and in fact, they've never. A lot of them, I'm not going to say all of them, of course, not a lot of them, uh, at least from where I come from, have actually tried learning a second foreign language to full proficiency. You know, I don't, I don't take, I don't accept uh, three years of high school uh, in our current education system as being proficient in the language. And how do teachers deal with this? Like I said, with my past research, there is a lot of variation in the way that uh, specifically American college professors will deal with that. Um, you know, there's different ways to go about it. You could be supportive, like the French professor. You could be a little bit more strict, like the Russian professor. Um, and you can incorporate things that the Arabic professor said. You know, when you're teaching a language, it's going to be, <clears throat> um, you know, it's going to be a necessary and important to recognize those things in your students when you're teaching. Um, so different ways you could deal with it. Um, we can learn a little bit about that, uh, about language ideology from these professors and how they deal with that. And of course, how should we deal with it? Uh, this is a little bit, you know, the, the part where I'd like to uh, conclude and just uh, give my own thoughts here. Uh, how should we deal with this? These are my recommendations for it. Uh, the way we present language learning to people has to be honest but non-threatening. We can't put the polyglot lifestyle on a pedestal either. So what I mean by that is we, uh, we need to be honest but non-threatening we need to say, yes, there are challenging parts to Russian. There are challenging parts to Chinese. There are challenges whenever you learn a language. But it's never impossible to learn. It's never going to be uh, you know, something that you're never going to get, you know, spend 10 years on and you can't form a sentence properly. <clears throat> Some people might be afraid of that. And at the same time, if you put if you are, if you have, uh, if you're learning, if you know five languages, six languages, up to, you know, 10, 13, however many languages, if you say, you know, oh, I'm so great, I'm so talented, you know, I have, I have a, a skill that not many other people have. When you say that, 
it means it reinforces this thing, this, uh, like I said before, this, uh, oh, I wish I could do that mentality. Um, so you want to make sure that when you're talking about language to people, you want to put it in a more encouraging way. Um, the second thing, which I've seen a lot, mostly on Facebook, because people like to argue on the, on the internet, um, don't be upset if people don't share your particular motivations for language learning. Sure, if people are going to learn it for utilitarian perspectives, they're going to learn it for utilitarian perspectives and, and purposes. You can't change that. Don't try to change it. You can encourage them to change, but don't. Because if you, get, if you both get upset, oh, the microphone is dead. Uh, if, you, uh, if you do get upset over it, then it goes, it's going to be uh, people in general, uh, both of you, adding to the discouragement. Um, you know, you're going to be angry with them. They're going to be like, well, maybe I shouldn't learn a language. Screw that. I don't, I don't know. Screw that. And then, number three, uh, be conscious about your own preconceived notions about language learning or particular languages. Do you, you know, reflect on yourself. Do you say any of these things that I've said up here? Do you think that there's anything similar that you might have said up here? Um, you know, thinking about, you know, um, Russian or, or Arabic, if you're a native speaker of, the, uh, of those, like, either of those languages. No worries. Either of those languages. No worries. Hello? Do, do, do. Uh, if anyone has, uh, if you're a native speaker of Russian or Arabic, you know, and you, ha and you say these things to people, think about why do you hold the opinions that you do? Where did they come from? Did they come from other people or your own personal experience? So uh, those are three recommendations that I would, um, you know, give to you about this topic. Um, as a per person who personally wants to help others to learn languages who aren't necessarily in the polyglot community, I think we're fine in terms of motivation and language learning. But in my own communities, where it's not so prevalent, I want to make sure that people understand with, with realistic expectations the process of learning a language, motivation, continuing motivation, and deciding to pick up a language. Um, so uh, I'd be happy to talk with anyone about this after the presentation. Um, for me, I think this is a very important topic just because uh, as the polyglot community, I think we are the best representatives uh, that are able to go out to our own communities and help others uh, in the world, you know, uh, to learn different languages and understand their value and help them find their own personal motivation for doing so. Um, so I am happy to take any questions and thank you all for listening. Yes. Yeah. Should we bring the microphone to? It's whatever. <laughs> uh, yeah, thank you for your very interesting presentation. I just had this uh, one thought. Well, you touched uh, upon it a little bit with uh, Russian native speakers, like that they also have certain uh, attitudes towards uh, learners. And uh, uh, I was wondering, uh, do you think that uh, American learners of foreign languages have certain expectations of, uh, I don't know, cooperativeness from the native speakers of the languages they are learning at, uh, that they may react uh, in uh, certain ways if they don't get that cooperation or if uh, they aren't uh, greeted as enthusiastically as they expect? Yeah, very great question. Um, I think that uh, language learning, at least from the American standpoint, uh, it also works a lot off of stereotypes. Um, so if someone's learning Russian and they want to talk to a Russian, maybe if they actually have a very intrinsic motivation, they won't think of in stereotypes. But uh, I think a lot of Americans who are, let's say they're learning Russian as their first foreign language. They might say, um, okay, um, so I'm probably gonna get a guy named Vladimir um, who's going to talk like this and he's uh, not going to help me very much. So, you know, I, I think that Americans might think of in stereotypes, just, I mean, hey, the history between, you know, Cold War, America, Russia, whatever, they might think in those types of, uh, you know, those types of terms and they'll say, you know, he's not gonna be very helpful with me or uh, things like that. Of course, that's not true, um, especially if you're doing language exchange, like if, if a Russian contacts you for help in English and they'll help you in Russian, then it's, it's usually uh, pretty mutually beneficial. Um, but I think that um, generally, from the American standpoint, it, a lot of things, and not just Russian, a lot of other languages might work off a little bit of stereotypes. That answer the question? Yeah, okay, I'd be happy to talk with you after. Uh, 
Hi, I have a question uh, regarding the stereotypes that we just discussed. Like, uh, in view of the fact that what Google Translator used to do in 2010 and what it does in 2017, how do you see the way artificial intelligence is progressing? And how is it dealing with this language superstition or, or linguistic diversity? Where will this, this drive from the utilitarian perspective go in future in the next 10 years? Very good question as well. Um, now, I, I want to preface this by saying that I'm not an expert in AI or how it's going to develop, but seeing how Google Translate and things like uh, things similar to it, you know, there's there's these new things that I always see on Facebook. Those freaking advertisements, um, you know, with the with the speaking and the the, the little device thing. What is, what is that called? Does anyone know the name of that? It's it's those things where you can just speak and it'll translate automatically for you. Um, you know, to people who don't learn languages often, that's like a very impressive thing. That's like, oh, technology solving everything for us. We don't have to learn languages anymore. Great. Um, it's a little scary. I'll, I'll, I'll admit that. Um, for Google Translate, it is getting better. I, I, I will say that. It, it is getting better. Um, but I think that uh, maybe from a utilitarian perspective, you know, the people who are going to use Google Translate, you know, as a, a tool, huh, I, I don't know. I'm not going to say they won't, they wouldn't be able to be convinced, but they might be a little more hard-hearted towards language learning in the first place, and they might think of it in that utilitarian perspective. Not to say that, not to say that they can't be convinced, but uh, you know, what's scary about it is that that's going to reinforce the utilitarian perspective of language learning. Um, how to change that? I'm not sure. Maybe that's a perspective. That's maybe that's topic for a presentation in the future. Um, but but yeah, that's as much as I can give you on that. I can I'd be, be happy to talk with you about it afterwards as well. Yes. So I've got a specific question about you know, how to encourage people to learn Chinese sure. while being realistic. Because uh, I go about just right with Russian, I think, because I learned Russian myself. And I tell people when people are saying, okay, it's a different alphabet, but I think that's the least concern. I mean, like, after five days, you get used to it, and everything's going to be fine. But with Chinese, somehow, I, I couldn't find a good way to do it, because realistically, I mean, we're, we're, like most of us are polyglots here, we're the best language learners, supposedly. And yet, if I would be like 100% honest, I can see like how many people really acquire uh, Chinese as a second language fluently. Very, very few. So it's like when someone asks me, oh, what do you think, should I go to speak Chinese? I usually say like, no. If, if you want to devote 10 years of your life to learning Chinese, if you're not living in China, then you might have a chance. So you need a really strong motivation for it. Because it's like, I realized that the problem of just telling people, okay, it's totally possible, you just go and learn it, and then you're gonna be very good at it, is like after three, four years of trying, people just like, that's a lie. I've tried like three and four years, I've made very little progress. Like, why the hell did you tell me that it's so easy to do it? It's, it's really not. I mean, as a native speaker, I understand it. It's like when you see it, and I think you can see it from a reverse perspective, there are like so many uh, Chinese people learning English, and it's a state program. But after like 10, 15 years, with like half a million people abroad studying who need English, still very few like native speakers of Chinese could like master English language. So you kind of understand the, the gap in between the two. So like, I'm really not sure how should I, because I, as a native Chinese speaker, I definitely want to encourage people to learn Chinese, to know about Chinese culture, but also I want to be very realis realistic about it to see, you know, yeah. what kind of advice I can give to people. Yeah. Okay. Sure, so that question hits a little bit close to home because I've had a definitely very, a lot of trouble with Chinese. Um, and given the context of this presentation, I probably shouldn't be saying that. Um, but uh, it is, you know, from a realistic perspective, it is a difficult language. Not, not impossible, but it is, it is very difficult because it's one of the most, far, it's, it's, you know, one of the most distant from English that, ex that exists, at least one of the biggest, most distant, I'll say, most, most spoken. Um, what I would say, if, I, if you want a practical tip, I can give you theoretical tips. If you want a practical tip, I would say, if they're, if they're an English speaker, if they're a native English speaker, tell them to learn a, a foreign, if they're monolingual, tell them to learn a foreign language that's closest, that's closer to English before it. Because if they don't know the proper ways to study the language, a, a, a language that is as complex as Chinese, given the native English speaker context, they're not going to understand those things, and then you know you're also you're you're jumping into the language learning pool. That's one thing before you get your feet wet. 
That's a, that's one problem. The second problem uh, is, I mean, if they don't know another, other, another language, then I mean, I guess it's the same thing as the first one. You know, it's it's just the fact that, that if they don't have experience with the language learning process, they're going to find Chinese uh, le learning actual Chinese, uh, you know, a lot harder. So, if you, for example, are a native English speaker and you learn Spanish, you'll know how to learn a language. If you learn to prof proficiency, I mean, I don't I don't mean you know take three years in high school and then say puedo ir al baño, but you know after you uh, know that process, you might be a little bit more inclined to understand the learning process. The second thing that I would say is that uh, language learning. Not, I think Richard Simcott gave a presentation on this. Not all languages are created equal for the learner. There are certain languages that are going to be naturally more difficult for certain types of people, which I, f I don't understand that phenomenon, but it happens. Um, I notice that me, um, as a language learner personally, I learned Italian as my first foreign language before I even had my feet wet in language learning. It was my first foreign language, modern foreign language, I should, I should say. Um, before that, uh, you know, when I was learning Italian, I learned it very well. It's my, it's my best foreign language at this moment. And then I learned all those other languages that are on my card. And then I learned Greek. And I find that while the grammar wasn't that bad for me, I still can't speak it with as much fluency as I can Italian, even though it's pretty, you know, similar in difficulty to say Italian, uh, you know, German, Russian. It's like in the middle between all of those, in my, in my own opinion. Um, but, you know, I can't speak it with as much fluency. I can't speak it with as, as good an accent, which I'm still working on, by the way. Um, but, you know, in the Chinese context, that might be a problem too. Once again, doesn't mean it's impossible to learn, but it's going to take a lot more work for that specific person. Um, so, you know, there are only so many realistic things you can say to the person without, without misleading them. You know, you can't say, oh, it's easy. Just go and, go and live in China for, you know, it's whatever. You'll learn in a year. That's okay. Um, so, you know, that's, that's the advice that I can give you if that, if that helps. But yeah, thank yep, thank you for the question. Um, yeah, actually, I just wanted to say two things. I'm t learning Chinese myself, and I was pretty confident, actually, that I might learn Chinese pretty well inside maybe a year or two. And, well, um, of course, it didn't go as smoothly as I thought, and, of course, like, my Chinese is pretty basic. But um, I always tend to say, I think, like, what is most important is that people, people who are afraid of learning languages, they're... Um, really afraid of um, spending a long time to learn something that might not work out for them. So maybe instead of saying, well, it will take you 10 years, so you have to like really, um, uh, you know, do it for 10 years and really, you know, sacrifice your time. Instead, you could say, well, you can um, concentrate for one year and really try to and really like do it a couple of hours a day and um, have a language immersion or something like that. And you will reach the basics and you will be uh, confident in the basics. Um, and then, um, and I think like that mostly works out. I mean, the second thing I wanted to say is that all languages are made by people for people. So I think there's no language that is impossible to learn and that's what I usually say to people. And um, I mean, when it comes to Chinese characters, um, I think it's um, a very logical system so that I also um, try to like explain to people that everything is based actually on um, like uh, pictures and so if you think of a tree or something like you know most Chinese characters have radicals that actually still um, show where it comes from or where it derives from so it's actually um, it's like a small game or something and then you know when you just like try to um, explain to them like maybe a simple character like ma or or, or something like this so it usually it usually um, takes away the fear and also like um, maybe evoke some interest and yeah that's about it. it all depends on the, uh, on the goal. Uh, if, we have, if we have more questions, is, it, is there anyone who wants to ask a question yet? I just want to make sure everyone gets that. Thank you for the wonderful presentation. I would like to ask you, what uh, do you do in your uh, life in order to encourage uh, people from the community to learn more languages or uh, to encourage the university professors? So what do I do in my own 
personal life. Um, like I said, I founded the organization GW Polyglots on my campus. Um, so what we do, for example, we have bi-weekly, so every two weeks we have um, a, a language exchange for people to come, just an hour, you know, a dinner, you know, we write s cards similar to these where everyone can come and practice. We provide things, uh, resources on social media. We also, uh, from a non-utilitarian perspective, we uh, provide people with, uh, you know, uh, sources, let's say, to uh, the videos of Luca Lampariello or of Richard Simcott, because I think that a lot for a lot of people, some people it might demotivate, but for a lot of people, it actually motivates them to continue um, to see these success stories, to see these people who are very popular in the community, who have who have you know reached new heights of language learning. Um, so that's what I try to do personally, and of course, I also uh, teach foreign languages. I teach English, Italian, Spanish, and Russian. Um, so when I teach my students, I always make sure to put in those those comments you know like like uh, the the girl who just commented before um, it's not impossible to learn there are certain things that you have to do you have to be diligent you have to be motivated but it's never impossible so you know promoting those things in the community is something that I do you know on a you know every semester when I'm at university um, and with the language professors of course um, I'm, I can't I can't simply tell them what to do but um, you know, I try to get them in, as involved as possible with helping their students with this motivation factor, um, with, this, with this ideology factor, with these notions that they might have. And some professors do, some professors do not. Um, in the end, at the end of the day, it's not my choice. I can only spread the ideas and hopefully uh, people will listen, of course. Thank you for the question. Any other questions? One more question. Anyone else? No? Doesn't seem to be any. Okay, well, if there are no more questions, I want to thank everyone for coming again. Oh, one more question. Yes. Okay. <laughs> uh, what I would like to know if, according to your experience, is it is more difficult for English-speaking people to learn Russian because of the grammar or Chinese because of the tones and all these things? Thank you for the question. Uh, like I said before, since all languages are not created equal for the learner, I can't definitively say, you know, Russian is harder for English speakers, period. Chinese is harder for English speakers, period. What I can say, and this is an idea by, by Luca Lampariello, by the way, um, is not really how complex the grammar is, how, you know, what, if there are tones or not, it's really about how distant the language is from your native language um, in terms of those, those factors as a whole. Um, you know, distance as in how long it might take to learn it because of how different it is, grammar, pronunciation, everything else that you can imagine. Um, so, I typically take it as distance, and then second, I take it as your own personal motivation to learn. You know, if you are more inclined to learn grammar, I, for example, really like learning grammar. I, I, I learned with the monotonous method of textbooks. Um, I, you know, that's how I learned Russian and I really enjoyed it because the complex grammar is actually interesting to me. While with Chinese, while the grammar in itself has a couple patterns, it's, it's more simple than Russian to be sure, um, but there are different, you know, because of that, there are other factors that I'm not so good at, which lead to more difficulties in, in, in Mandarin Chinese in particular. So I can't say really, you know, whether or not it's going to be absolutely more difficult with Russian or, or Chinese, but I will say that it's relative to the learner based on what their interests are and what they're, what they're good at, you know, based on many, many different factors. Thank you for the question. So thank you everyone for coming. I'll be here. I'll be here for the next couple of minutes. If you'd like to come down, talk with me about the, you know, if you had any other questions, I'd be happy to discuss. Thank you for coming.